Welcome to my section on short stories. This short story is The Velt by Ray Bradbury. Now here's a couple of images, um, book covers and other sort of paintings I've found about the story. I just want you to take a brief moment to have a look at all of these. And I want you to think what could the story be about? Who might the characters be? Where might it be set? When might it be set? What could the plot be? What type, what genre or subgenre do you think this uh, story might be? Really get a sense of that and uh, maybe drop in the comments your, uh, your predictions. And um, before we begin, let's start with some context. So, it was written by a chap called Ray Bradbury, who was born in the 1920. He died in 2012, unfortunately. He is the author of Fahrenheit 451, and the Velt was written in 1950. So, just a quick look. So, there he is. There's Ray Bradbury, and there's his most famous story, Fahrenheit 451. Uh, Fahrenheit 451 is a dystopian story about, you know, um, censorship and where technology's going. It's a really, really interesting read. It is one of the uh, high school must reads, so I suggest everyone read that. And they even made a TV show recently starring um, the guy from Black Panther and the guy, the bad guy from Superman. So two villains, one villain from Van Black Panther, one villain from Superman. Uh, anyway, The Velt was written in 1950, I digress. Um, this was the golden age. It was after World War II, meaning there was a boom economy. The, uh, the depression of the 1930s had ended. They got a war with um, Germany and Japan, but the war was won and America had profited from it. They were doing very well and their economy was booming. Women were also in work. Obviously, a lot of men get sent to war in times of war. Women who stay behind or uh, during this period when women stayed behind, they would often take the space of men at work. But what happened is that after the war, women went, I quite like this, I think I'm gonna stay at work. And we also have the, this idea of the nuclear family, uh, two parents and children all living together under one roof, a bit like this. Uh, also, as I said, you know, the economy's booming. They're also producing things, particularly technology, and they become a lot cheaper. Cheap electronics, uh, the average family could own cars and several TVs, you know, three TVs maybe, refrigerators, irons, vacuum cleaners, all sorts. And families were encouraged to buy more technology. The times were changing though. You know, you can already imagine the way things were going, uh, sort of meal times where families would sit around the table talking to one another. These suddenly became time to watch TV. Uh, you know, the mums who typically were at home were now deciding to go to work. The times were changing, this upset a lot of people. Now, as you read the story, as you hear the audiobook and you read along with it and you see the, the highlighted sections and hear expl extra explanations and analysis, I want you to consider a couple of things. What themes can you spot and what is Ray Bar Bradbury's central message? What literary devices can you spot and how do they develop the story? How do they develop themes or characters, symbols? What is the tone when describing the children, or when describing the house, or when describing the nursery? And how are the characters characterised? These are the things I want you to look for when you read. Please enjoy the audiobook. Ray Bradbury's story, The Velt, is performed by Stephen Colbert. George, I wish you'd look at the nursery. What's wrong with it? I don't know. Well, then. I just want you to look at it, is all, and call a psychologist in to look at it. What would a psychologist want with the nursery? You know very well what he'd want. His wife paused in the middle of the kitchen and watched the stove busily humming to itself, making supper for four. It's just that the nursery is different now than it was. All right, let's have a look. They walked down the hall of their soundproofed happy life home, which had cost them $30,000 installed. This house which clothed and fed and rocked them to sleep and played and sang and was good to them. Their approach sensitized a switch somewhere and the nursery light flicked on when they came within 10 feet of it. Similarly, behind them in the halls, lights went on and off as they left them behind with a soft automaticity. Well said George Hadley. 
They stood on the thatched floor of the nursery. It was 40 feet across by 40 feet long and 30 feet high. It had cost half again as much as the rest of the house, but nothing's too good for our children, George had said. The nursery was silent. It was as empty as a jungle glade at hot high noon. The walls were blank and two-dimensional. Now, as George and Lydia Hadley stood in the center of the room, the walls began to purr and recede into crystalline distance, it seemed, and presently an African veldt appeared in three dimensions on all sides in color reproduced to the final pebble and bit of straw. The ceiling above them became a deep sky with a hot yellow sun. George Hadley felt the perspiration start on his brow. Let's get out of this sun, he said. It's a little too real, but uh, I don't see anything wrong. Wait a moment, you'll see, said his wife. Now the hidden odorophonics were beginning to blow a wind of odor at the two people in the middle of the baked Veltland. The hot straw smell of lion grass, the cool green smell of the hidden water hole, the great rusty smell of animals, the smell of dust like a red paprika in the hot air. And now the sounds, the thump of distant antelope feet on grassy sod, the papery rustling of vultures. A shadow passed through the sky. The shadow flickered on George Hadley's upturned, sweating face. Filthy creatures, he heard his wife say. Vultures? You see, there are the lions. Far over, that way. Now they're on their way to the water hole. They've just been eating, said Lydia. I don't know what. Some animal. George Hadley put his hand up to shield off the burning light from his squinted eyes. A zebra or a baby giraffe, maybe. Are you sure? His wife sounded peculiarly tense. No, it's a little late to be sure, he said, amused. Nothing I can see over there but cleaned bone and the vultures dropping for what's left. Did you hear that scream? She asked. No. About a minute ago. Sorry, no. <laughs> the lions were coming. And again, George Hadley was filled with admiration for the mechanical genius who had conceived this room, a miracle of efficiency selling for an absurdly low price. Every home should have one. Oh, occasionally they frightened you with their clinical accuracy. They startled you, gave you a twinge, but most of the time, what fun for everyone, not only for your own son and daughter, but for yourself as well, when you felt like a quick jaunt to a foreign land, a quick change of scenery. Well, here it was. And here were the lions now, 15 feet away, so real, so feverishly and startlingly real that you could feel the prickling fur on your hand, and your mouth was stuffed with the dusty upholstery smell of their heated pelts, and the yellow of them was in your eyes like the yellow of an exquisite French tapestry, the yellow of lions and summer grass, and the sound of the matted lion lungs exhaling on the silent noontide and the smell of meat from the panting, dripping mouths. The lion stood looking at George and Lydia Hadley with terrible green-yellow eyes. Watch out! screamed Lydia. The lions were running at them. Lydia bolted and ran. Instinctively, George sprang after her. Outside in the hall with the door slammed, he was laughing and she was crying, and they both stood appalled at the other's reaction. George! Lydia! <laughs> Oh, my poor, sweet Lydia. They almost got us. Walls, Lydia. Remember, crystal walls, that's all they are. Oh, they look real, I must admit. Africa in your parlor. But it's all dimensional, super reactionary, super sensitive color film and mental tape film behind glass screens. It's all odorophonics and sonics, Lydia. Here's my handkerchief. I'm afraid. She came to him and put her body against him and cried steadily. Did you see? Did you feel it? It's too real. Now, Lydia, you've got to tell Wendy and Peter not to read any more on Africa. Of course. Of course. He patted her. Promise? Sure. And lock the nursery for a few days until my nerves get settled? You know how difficult Peter is about that. When I punished him a month ago by locking the nursery even for a few hours, the tantrum he threw. And Wendy, too. They live for the nursery. It's got to be locked. That's all there is to it. All right. Reluctantly, he locked the huge door. You've been working too hard. You need a rest. 
So the first page of the story, it's clear that this is a house of the future. Um, it cost them a lot of money by the sounds of it, or it would have been a lot of money when the story was written. Um, and it's this house which can do incredibly scientific mechanical things. One thing they have is a room called the nursery. And the nursery has these sort of crystalline walls with uh, machines like odorophonics that can change and make the room appear as if it's something else. In this case, an African veldt land. Um, now it's kind of just like an AR room. Uh, what's really interesting though is how the house is described and there's a lot of personification I want you to really pay close attention to in the story um, when describing the house. For instance, the stove was busy humming to itself. The house clothed and fed and rocked them to sleep and played and sang and was good to them. So it's talking about the house, this futuristic scientific house as if it is a person. Uh, the walls began to purr is another example. I also want you to see how the characters are characterized. We have the parents, George and Lydia, and we can see already that his wife kind of feels, Lydia, she kind of feels that she's not being useful. She's not really like a mother. She stands back and watches as this house does things. Um, George says there's nothing too good for our children, uh, sort of showing that he is kind of the type of parent who might spoil them a little bit. Lydia screams, runs, cries a lot. Um, so she, maybe she's a bit kind of emotional at the moment. Uh, and then finally as well, something that's really interesting, the children are called Wendy and Peter, which is allusion to Peter Pan. Uh, allusion is where you reference another story, movie, whatever. Um, and people can kind of guess what happens because of that. So in Peter Pan, obviously there's no adults in Neverland. Well, we've got kids here called Wendy and Peter. What might that allude to? Also see how the children are being spoken about at the end of the page. At first George says, nothing is too good for our children. And then at the end of this page, he says, well, they threw a tantrum, a huge tantrum. So why might this be important? I don't know. I don't know, she said, blowing her nose, sitting down in a chair that immediately began to rock and comfort her. <laughs> Maybe I don't have enough to do. Maybe I have too much time to think. Why don't we shut the whole house off for a few days and take a vacation? You mean you want to fry eggs for me? Yes, she nodded. Darn my socks. Yes, a frantic, watery-eyed nodding, and sweep the house? Yes, yes, oh, yes. But I thought that's why we bought this house, so we wouldn't have to do anything. Well, that's just it. I, I don't feel like I belong here. This house is wife and mother now and nursemaid. Can I compete with an African veldt? Can I give a bath and scrub the children as efficiently or as quickly as the automatic scrub bath can? I cannot. And it isn't just me, it's you. You've been awfully nervous lately. Suppose I have been smoking too much. You look as if you don't know what to do with yourself in this house either. You smoke a little more every morning and drink a little more every afternoon and you need a little more sedative every night. You're beginning to feel unnecessary too. Am I? He paused and tried to feel inside of himself to see what was really there. Oh, George. She looked beyond him at the nursery door. Those lines can't get out of there, can they? He looked at the door and saw it tremble as if something had jumped against it from the other side. Of course not, he said. At dinner they ate alone, for Wendy and Peter were at a special plastic carnival across town and had televised home to say that they'd be late to go ahead eating. So George Hadley, bemused, sat watching the dining room table produce warm dishes of food from its mechanical interior. We forgot the ketchup. He said, Sorry. <laughs> said a small voice within the table, and ketchup appeared. <laughs> As for the nursery, thought George Hadley, it wouldn't hurt for the children to be locked out of it for a while. Too much of anything isn't good for anyone, and it was clearly indicated that the children had been spending a little too much time on Africa. That sun. He could feel it on his neck still, like a hot paw and the lions and the smell of blood. Remarkable how the nursery caught the telepathic emanations of the children's minds and created life to fill their every desire. 
The children thought lions, and there were lions. The children thought zebras, and there were zebras. Sun, sun, giraffe, giraffe, death and death. That last. He chewed tastelessly on the meat that the table had cut for him. Death thoughts, they were awfully young. Wendy and Peter for death thoughts. Or, no, you were never too young, really. Long before you knew what death was, you were wishing it on someone else. When you were two years old, you were shooting people with cap pistols. But this, the long, hot African veldt, the awful death in the jaws of a lion, and repeated again and again? Where are you going? He didn't answer Lydia. Preoccupied, he let the lights glow softly on ahead of him, extinguished behind him as he padded to the nursery door. He listened against it. Far away, a lion roared. He unlocked the door and opened it. Just before he stepped inside, he heard a faraway scream, and then another roar from the lions, which subsided quickly. He stepped into Africa. How many times in the last year had he opened this door and found Wonderland, Alice, the Mock Turtle, or Aladdin in his magic lamp, or Jack Pumpkinhead of Oz, or Dr. Doolittle, or the cow jumping over a very real appearing moon, all the delightful contraptions of a make-believe world? How often had he seen Pegasus flying in the sky ceiling, or seen fountains of red fireworks, or heard angel voices singing? But now, this yellow-hot Africa this bake oven with murder in the heat. Perhaps Liddy was right. Perhaps they needed a little vacation from the fantasy which was growing a bit too real for ten-year-old children. It was all right to exercise one's mind with gymnastic fantasies, but when the lively child mind settled on one pattern, it seemed that at a distance for the past month he had heard lions roaring and smelled their strong odor seeping as far away as his study door. But... Being busy, he had paid it no attention. George Hadley stood on the African grasslands alone. The lions looked up from their feeding, watching him. The only flaw in the illusion was the open door through which he could see his wife, far down the hall like a framed picture, eating her dinner abstractedly. Go away, he said to the lions. They did not go. He knew the principle of the room exactly. You sent out your thoughts, whatever you thought would appear. Let's have Aladdin and his lamp, he snapped. The Veltlin remained. The lions remained. Come on, room, I demand Aladdin, he said. Nothing happened. The lions mumbled in their baked pelts. Aladdin! (laughs) He went back to dinner. The full room's out of order, he said. It won't respond. Or, or what? Or it can't respond, said Lydia, because the children have thought about Africa and the lions and killing so many days that the room's in a rut. Could be. Or Peter said it to remain that way. Said it? He may have got into the machinery and fixed something. Peter doesn't know machinery. He's a wise one for ten. That IQ of his, nevertheless. Hello, Mom. Hello, Dad. The Hadleys turned. Wendy and Peter were coming in the front door, cheeks like peppermint candy, eyes like bright blue agate marbles, the smell of ozone on their jumpers from their trip in the helicopter. You're just in time for supper, said both parents. On the second page, we see uh, more personification. So the chair immediately begins to rock and comfort her. She says about the house that the house is wife and mother and nursemaid, again personifying the house. Uh, the table had cut the food for him. Again, lots of personification to describe the house. We get a bit more characterization, particularly with Lydia and George here as well. Um, we see that Lydia really does feel uh, unnecessary, irrelevant and useless uh, as she's not doing these motherly things. She's not cooking and cleaning and taking care of the children, which she wants to do. Uh, because the house is doing it instead and she's getting very upset about that she also says that George is succumbing to his vices a lot more he's smoking and drinking because he's not uh, feeling necessary she says you're beginning to feel unnecessary too also at dinner the parents eat alone because the children's children are out now that might not seem weird today but when the story would have been written um, 
it would be unheard of for children and parents to eat at home. There's something very famous called the nuclear family, where you've got mum, dad, and usually two children, and they would they would always be together, they would always eat together, they would have these family meals together, and instead these children televised, which would be like a video call presumably, to say they'd be home late. Whilst they're at a plastic carnival, now the plastic almost gives a sense that it's, it's fake, anything plastic isn't real. Um, there's some, I, I don't want to spoil anything, but there's some foreshadowing as well, hearing faraway screams, and uh, lions roaring, and they smell strange odors even when they're not in the nursery. And then finally, at the end of this page, the children come home. Now pay attention to what they look like. Cheeks like pe peppermint candy, and eyes like bright blue agate marbles. Um, what? You know, how, how are they characterized? By looking at them, how are they characterized? And see how that differs from the tantrums we've heard about, and how they act in later pages. Parents. We're full of strawberry ice cream and hot dogs, said the children, holding hands, but we'll sit and watch. Come tell us about the nursery, said George Hadley. The brother and sister blinked at him and then at each other. Nursery? All about Africa and everything, said the father with false joviality. I don't understand, said Peter. Your mother and I were just traveling through Africa with Rod and Reel, Tom Swift and his electric lion said George Hadley. There's no Africa in the nursery, said Peter simply. Oh, come now, Peter, we know better. I don't remember any Africa, said Peter to Wendy. Do you? No. Run see and come tell. She obeyed. Wendy, come back here, said George Hadley, but she was gone. The house lights followed her like a flock of fireflies. Too late, he realized he had forgotten to lock the nursery door after his last inspection. When do you look and come tell us, said Peter. She doesn't have to tell me. I've seen it. I'm sure you're mistaken, father. I'm not, Peter. Come along now. But Wendy was back. It's not Africa, she said breathlessly. We'll see about this, said George Hadley. And they all walked down the hall together and opened the nursery door. There was a green, lovely forest, a lovely river, a purple mountain, high voices singing, and Rima lovely and mysterious, lurking in the trees with colorful flights of butterflies like animated bouquets lingering in her long hair. The African Veltland was gone. The lions were gone. Only Rima was there now, singing a song so beautiful that it brought tears to your eyes. George Hadley looked in at the change scene. Go to bed, he said to the children. They opened their mouths. You heard me, he said. They went off to the air closet where the wind sucked them like brown leaves up the flue to their slumber rooms. <laughs> George Hadley walked through the singing glade and picked up something that lay in the corner near where the lions had been. He walked slowly back to his wife. What is that? she asked. An old wallet of mine, he said. He showed it to her. The smell of hot grass was on it and the smell of a lion. There were drops of saliva on it. It had been chewed and there were blood smears on both sides. He closed the nursery door and locked it tight. In the middle of the night, he was still awake and he knew his wife was awake. Do you think Wendy changed it? She said at last in the dark room. Of course. Made it from a veldt into a forest and put Rima there instead of the lions. Yes. Why? I don't know, but it's staying locked until I find out. How did your wallet get there? I don't know anything, he said, except that I'm beginning to be sorry that we had bought that room for the children. If the children are neurotic at all, a room like that, it's supposed to help them work off their neuroses in a helpful way. I'm starting to wonder. He stared at the ceiling. We've given the children everything they ever wanted. Is this our reward, secrecy, disobedience? Who said it? Children are carpets. They should be stepped on occasionally. <laughs> We've never lifted a hand. They're insufferable. Let's admit it. They come and go when they like. They treat us as if we were offspring. They're spoiled and we're spoiled. They've been acting very funny ever since you forbade them to take the rocket to New York a few months ago. They're not old enough to do that alone, I explained. Nevertheless, I've noticed they've been decidedly cool toward us since. I think I'll have David McLean come tomorrow morning and have a look at Africa. 
But it's not Africa now. It's Green Mansion's country in Rima. I have a feeling it'll be Africa again before then. A moment later, they heard the screams. Two screams. Two people screaming from downstairs. And then a roar of lions. Wendy and Peter aren't in their rooms, said his wife. He lay in his bed with his beating heart. Nope, he said. They've broken into the nursery. Those screams, they sound familiar. Do they? Yes, awfully. And although their beds tried very hard, the two adults couldn't be rocked to sleep for another hour. A smell of cats was in the night air. Father, said Peter. Yes? Peter looked down at his shoes. He never looked at his father anymore, nor at his mother. You aren't going to lock up the nursery for good, are you? Well, that all depends. On what? Snapped Peter. On you and your sister. If you intersperse this Africa with a little variety, oh, Sweden perhaps, or Denmark, or China, I thought we were free to play as we wished. You are within reasonable bounds. What's wrong with Africa, father? Oh, so now you admit you've been conjuring up Africa, do you? I wouldn't want the nursery locked up, said Peter coldly. And again, on this page, we see more personification describing the house, but it's becoming a bit more natural and animalistic almost. The light's following her like a flock of fireflies. Uh, there's also lots of lovely imagery describing the um, what the scenery is in the nursery when the kids take it off of Africa. Um, you know, Africa is described as being insanely hot, very uncomfortable. Uh, the sun almost feels like they're in hatred directed towards the parents. But now it's in the forest. It's very soothing. It's very calm. Um, there's even a reference to Rima, the jungle girl, lovely and mysterious. You know, it's a, a much nicer place to be. Uh, they also find a wallet on the floor with blood and saliva and bite marks on it. What could that mean? It's it's the dad's wallet. So why might that be important? What could that foreshadow? Uh, foreshadowing, obviously, a literary device which kind of warns what's going to happen later in the story. Uh, again, I like this bit of character characterization here. We've given the children everything they ever wanted, and then in the next sort of sentence, they're insufferable. We've never lifted a hand. They're like carpets. They should be stepped on. So there's, there's an opposite, there's contrast, there's juxtaposition there where you've got, we've spoiled them and given them everything we've ever wanted. But let's be honest, they're insufferable. They're horrible. I don't like them. And I find that quite interesting. Again, uh, there's screams that they hear, two screams that sound familiar. What could that also be foreshadowing? Um, and then we see Peter. He looked at his shoes. He never looked at his father anymore. He speaks very coldly. How does that characterize Peter? What kind of character do you get from Peter from his actions and his speech, the way he says things? Is he a little psychopath? I don't know. What do you think? Never. As a matter of fact, we're thinking of turning the whole house off for about a month. Live sort of a carefree, one-for-all existence. That sounds dreadful. Why, I would have to tie my shoes instead of letting the shoe tire do it. And brush my own teeth and comb my hair and give myself a bath. It would be fun for a change, don't you think? No, it would be horrid. I didn't like it when you took out the picture painter last month. That's because I wanted you to learn to paint all by yourself, son. I don't want to do anything but look and listen and smell. What else is there to do? All right, go play in Africa. Will you shut off the house sometime soon? We're considering it. I don't think you'd better consider it anymore, father. I won't have any threats from my son. Very well. And Peter strolled off to the nursery. Am I on time? said David McLean. Breakfast, said George Hadley. Thanks, had some. What's the trouble? David, you're a psychologist. I should hope so. <laughs> well, then have a look at our nursery. You saw it a year ago when you dropped by. Did you notice anything peculiar about it then? Can't say that I did. The usual violences, a tendency toward a slight paranoia here and there, usual in children because they feel persecuted by parents constantly, but oh, really nothing. They walked down the hall. I locked the nursery up, explained the father. And the children broke back into it during the night and I let them stay so they could form the patterns for you to see. There was a terrible screaming from the nursery. 
Here it is, said George Hadley. See what you make of it. They walked in on the children without rapping. The screams had faded. The lions were feeding. Run outside a moment, children, said George Hadley. No, don't change the mental combination. Leave the walls as they are. Get. With the children gone, the two men stood studying the lions clustered at a distance, eating with great relish whatever it is they had caught. I wish I knew what it was, said George Hadley. Sometimes I can almost see. Do you think if I brought high-powered binoculars here and... David McLean laughed dryly. (laughs) Hardly. He turned to study all four walls. How long has this been going on? A little over a month. Certainly doesn't feel good. I want facts, not feelings. My dear George, a psychologist never saw a fact in his life. He only hears about feelings, vague things. This doesn't feel good, I tell you. Trust my hunches and my instincts. I have a nose for something bad. This is very bad. (laughs) My advice to you is to have the whole damn room torn down and your children brought to me every day during the next year for treatment. Is it that bad? I'm afraid so. One of the original uses for these nurseries was so that we could study the patterns left on the walls by the child's mind, study at our leisure and help the child. In this case, however, the room has become a channel toward destructive thoughts instead of a release away from them. Didn't you sense this before? I sensed only that you had spoiled your children more than most, and now you're letting them down in some way. What way? I wouldn't let them go to New York. What else? Now, I've taken a few machines from the house and threatened them a month ago with closing up the nursery unless they did their homework. I did close it for a few days to show I meant business. Aha! Does that mean something? Everything! Where before they had a Santa Claus, now they have a Scrooge. Children prefer Santas. You've let this room and this house replace you and your wife and your children's affections. This room is their mother and father, far more important in their lives than their real parents, and now you come along and want to shut it off. No wonder there's hatred here. You can feel it coming out of the sky. Feel that sun. George, you'll have to change your life. Like too many others, you've built it around creature comforts. Why, you'd starve tomorrow if something went wrong with your kitchen. You wouldn't know how to tap an egg. Nevertheless, turn everything off. Start new. It'll take time, but we'll make good children out of bad in a year. Wait and see. But won't the shock be too much for the children shutting the room up abruptly for good? I don't want them going any deeper into this. That's all. The lions were finishing with their red feast. The lions were standing on the edge of the clearing watching the two men. Now I'm feeling persecuted, said McLean. Let's get out of here. Never cared for these damn rooms. Make me nervous. Lions look real, don't they? Said George Hadley. I don't suppose there's any way... What? That they could become real. Not that I know. Some flaw in the machinery, a tampering or something. No. They went to the door. I don't imagine the room will like being turned off, said the father. Nothing ever likes to die, even a room. I wonder if it hates me for wanting to switch it off. (laughs) I really feel like on this page, Ray Bradbury, the author, has presented a dystopian future which is kind of where we're at today. The son, Peter says to his dad, I didn't like it when you took out the picture painter last month, to which his father replies, that's because I wanted you to learn to paint all by yourself, son. I just feel this is really sort of where we're at today with technology. We'd rather sort of watch someone or something else do something than do it ourselves. The son threatens him. I think you better. I don't think you'd better consider it anymore. Father speaks to him quite politely. How does that characterise him? We see some more foreshadowing. This terrible screaming from the nursery, and then we see a kind of warning from David, the psychologist. I sensed only you that you had spoiled your children more than most and now you're letting them down in some way sort of a warning to parents Uh, and then there's some more illusion where before they had a santa claus now they have a scrooge obviously referring to charles dickens a christmas carol scrooge is a mean character who doesn't like christmas Um, this room is their mother and father a bit more sort of sort of goes a metaphor there how this room is everything in their life it's the caregiver in their life 
and you could feel the hate coming out of the sky, feel that sun. Now, I also like um, this bit, which is definitely a warning about technology. Like too many others, you've built it around creature comforts. Why you'd starve tomorrow if something went wrong in your kitchen, you wouldn't know how to tap an egg. Kind of warning us that we're becoming lazy and dependent on technology and that we're not gonna be able to take care of ourselves if anything should ever go wrong. Paranoia is thick around here today, said David McLean. You can follow it like a spore. Hello. He bent and picked up a bloody scarf. This yours? No. George Hadley's face went rigid. It belongs to Lydia. They went to the fuse box together and threw the switch that killed the nursery. The two children were in hysterics. They screamed and pranced and threw things. They yelled and sobbed and swore and jumped at the furniture. You can't do that to the nursery. You can't. Now, children, the children flung themselves onto the couch, weeping. George, said Lydia Hadley, turn on the nursery just for a few moments. You can't be so abrupt. No. You can't be so cruel. Lydia, it's off and it stays off. And the whole damn house dies as of here and now. The more I see of this mess we've put ourselves in, the more it sickens me. We've been contemplating our mechanical electronic navels for too long. My God, how we need a breath of honest air. And he marched about the house, turning off the voice clocks, the stoves, the heaters, the shoe shiners, the shoe lacers, the body scrubbers and swabbers and massagers, and every other machine he could put his hand to. The house was full of dead bodies, it seemed. It felt like a mechanical cemetery, so silent. None of the humming, hidden energy of machines waiting to function at the tap of a button. Don't let them do it! wailed Peter at the ceiling as if he was talking to the house, the nursery. Don't let father kill everything. He turned to his father. Oh, I hate you. Insults won't get you anywhere. I wish you were dead. We were for a long while. Now we're going to really start living. Instead of being handled and massaged, we're going to live. Wendy was still screaming and Peter joined her again. Just a moment, just one moment, just another moment of nursery, they wailed. Oh, George, said the wife, it can't hurt. All right, all right, if we'll just shut up. One minute, mind you, then off forever. Daddy, 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 sang the children, smiling with wet faces. And then we're going on vacation. David McLean is coming back in half an hour to help us move out and get to the airport. I'm going to dress. You turn on the nursery for a minute, Lydia. Just a minute, mind you. And the three of them went babbling off while he let himself be vacuumed upstairs through the air flue and set about dressing himself. A minute later, Lydia appeared. I'll be glad when we get away, she sighed. Did you leave them in the nursery? I wanted to dress too. Oh, that horrid Africa. What can they see in it? Well, in five minutes, we'll be on our way to Iowa. Lord, how did we ever get in this house? What prompted us to buy a nightmare? Pride. Money. Foolishness. I think we'd better get downstairs before those kids get engrossed with those damn beasts again. Just then, they heard the children calling, Daddy! Mommy! Come quick! Quick! They went downstairs and the air flew and ran down the hall. The children were nowhere in sight. Wendy? Peter? They ran into the nursery. The Veltman was empty, save for the lions waiting, looking at them. Peter? Wendy? The door slammed. Wendy? Peter? George Hadley and his wife whirled and ran back to the door. Open the door! cried George Hadley, trying the knob. Why, they've locked it from the outside. Peter! He beat at the door. Open up! He heard Peter's voice outside the door. Don't let them switch off the nursery in the house, he was saying. Mr. and Mrs. George Hadley beat at the door. Now don't be ridiculous, children. It's time to go. Mr. McLean will be here in a minute. And... And then they heard the sounds. The lions on three sides of them in the yellow velt grass, padding through the dry straw, rumbling and roaring in their throats.
the lions. Mr. Hadley looked at his wife, and they turned and looked back at the beasts, edging slowly forward, crouching, tails stiff. Mr. and Mrs. Hadley screamed. And suddenly, they realized why those other screams had sounded familiar. Well, here I am, said David McLean in the nursery doorway. Oh, hello. He stared at the two children seated in the center of the open glade, eating a little picnic lunch. Beyond them was the water hole and the yellow veltlin. Above was the hot sun. He began to perspire. Where are your father and mother? The children looked up and smiled. Oh, they'll be here directly. Good, we must be going. At a distance, Mr. McLean saw the lions fighting and clawing and then quieting down to feed in silence under the shady trees. He squinted at the lions with his hand tipped to his eyes. Now the lions were done feeding. They moved to the water hole to drink. A shadow flickered over Mr. McLean's hot face. Many shadows flickered. The vultures were dropping down the blazing sky. A cup of tea? asked Wendy in the silence. And that's the end of the story. I'm sure you've got a few questions. Like what happened to the parents? What's going to happen to David? Now, obviously, the author has left it open to interpretation. Are the parents dead? Were they eaten by the lions? We don't know for sure what's going to happen to David. There's a cliffhanger at the end of the, in the denouement there. Um, let's go over a few things. So he, pen, he bent over and picked up the bloody scarf. It belongs to Lydia. Um, We've got more foreshadowing, so it's, you know, I think it's kind of clear what happens to them. Um, that's my interpretation, that they're dead. Uh, there we've got some more personification. Killed the nursery, house dies, the house was full of dead bodies, which refers to the electrical machines. It felt like a mechanical cemetery. I really like that simile there. Um, we've also got some characterization, how the children are acting, they're screaming, they're having a massive hissy fit. Uh, do remember as well Wendy and Peter allusion to Peter Pan, uh, the kids without parents who live on who go to Peter Pan to Neverland where there are no adults. Um, again, we've got some alliteration near the end, rumbling and roaring. I really like that rumbling and roaring, that R sound. Uh, you can almost hear that. It really adds to the sinister tone of this part of the story and how the lines are described. Again, we have vultures at the end. Vultures, what are they symbolic of? What do vultures uh, symbolize? You know, in real life, what do they do? They pick up, pick apart dead bodies. They're scavengers. They don't necessarily hunt live food. They look for dead food. So what could they symbolize uh, as they are in the sky? There we go. That's the story. I hope you enjoyed it.